we've discovered you hidden in the Caribbean and got you back finally. You, you've made an appearance on Twitter, and it was like there was no chance we weren't going to get you back on Real Vision. Hugh, how are you, my friend? Yeah, I, I don't know how how hidden I am, but <laughs> but certainly I've had my 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 coming out a moment. So what are you thinking? You, so you've you've obviously you've obviously got something in your head because you've started to reappear on Twitter, and I know you you've had a chat with Grant recently. Yeah. What are you starting to see that is capturing your imagination? I had to I had to leave the business at the end of 2017 um, because um, whilst I was passionate about everything, it it was becoming a joyless activity. You know? um, but it it did feel like exiting a little bit prematurely, and and like I said to you, I, I spend a lot of time just going back over everything that came to pass. And I've now committed to the, uh, the, the most attainable project for me. And I know it's grandiose and, 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 and self-projection, but kind of like you know, the, the first step is always the hardest step. You know, I could just hide. I, I, I live this incredible, wonderful, insanely good life. And I and that could be enough and I could just hide. But I, I, I kept having a sense of... Um, uh, regret and a sense that I, the, there were certain skill sets and, and like you should pursue them. Um, and and so the, 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 the first project that I could do was essentially just talk to camera and do um, the 15 years of my monthlies. You know, what, because, you know, typically I was, you know, I was forming a contentious posture and, and waiting for everyone else to kind of come in and, and, and get it and share it and, and participate. And and and, the, and allow me to monetize the idea, and so I was typically writing stuff where, you know, again, I, I describe myself as being a schizophrenic. I, I I heard voices in my head, and you know, you know those voices. Those voices, we sit there, you know, and, and well done you, because you know, you get it with your your letters and things. There is, give me more. <laughs> don't don't give me like the last six months chart. Like show me sixty years, show me a hundred years, and you. And then let's play with the moving averages. Let's do like 20 month, 40 month moving averages. Things that really don't cross that often. What happens when they cross? And let's ask a hundred questions, you know. Um, and so, you know, I, I had I had voices yelling at me. Um, and then, of course, I had um, a super smart intelligence team who would then go out and try and find um, some underlying justification. But those voices were very strong Um 20 years ago, almost, almost 18 years ago, when I set up the fund, 2002, beginning of 2003, I was a lo- long, short guy, but we wanted a macro fund because the world was set to kind of step out of that kind of territory into the wide, you know, the, the voices were coming from disparate places. You, you were beginning to see commodity charts. Um, prices were no longer falling. And when you vol adjusted and you put them relative to rather other risk assets, they were no longer losing their risk purchasing parity, if you will. And then they, you know, and they, and, and, and that took three, four years. And then they were kind of coming out of that saucer like platform and beginning to have a trend. And it was like, and of course, this was the emer- this was the emergence of China on sure. the global stage and its footprint beginning to have influence on the pricing of these global assets. And that's what the voices were were picking up, um, and you know, and I really went went for it. And we had just you know, I, I put out um, an Instagram. So I, I did I did November two thousand and two last night, and I put it out um, on on Instagram. And the you know, finance guys, they go to Instagram to look at bikinis. They don't go to Instagram to look at me. Yeah. I'm thinking about maybe the next one I'll wear a bikini. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm really struggling. I've got almost, I don't know, 10, I've got 9,000 uh, followers on Twitter. Um, and I think I've got 1,400 on, on Instagram. Yeah. Twitter works for the finance crowd. I don't know why, because like Elon Musk says, that the, the, you know, the, the broadband of, of video content is just so more immediate and, and you can just put so much out there. Uh, it's not just what you say, it's how you say it. And then there's the background, it's what you're wearing, it's kind of how your arms are moving, et cetera. 
Um, and unless, because, you know, I'm still obviously to learn how to thread a Twitter. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's hilarious. I saw that. I saw, yeah, Hugh's learning. I can see. Hey, I'm sitting there and it keeps saying, too many words. I'm like, what do you mean too many fucking words? Pardon, too many words. So now I'm like, huh, okay, let's take that word out. Let, you know. Uh, and then someone sends me a message, dude, you got a thread. I'm like, what? <laughs> um, but my understanding is, you, you know, you can only put, like, it's, it's old Instagram in the sense you can, you can only do 30 second type uh, videos, whereas Instagram has Instagram TV now. Yeah. So, but last night I did October 2003 and, and and I was just saying, well, you know, he, this was the chart set up back then, and this is what I started to do. We found this little uh, company, Amsterdam Commodities. They they weren't looking for investors. They didn't want investors. You know, they were yielding ten percent, and they had an earnings yield of fourteen, so they distributed pretty much all of the cash flow. Um, and they made markets in the most obscure little kind of condiment type um, uh, commodities, and. But if you looked at it and you try to sell it, it's like whatever kind of thing. And I went on to say that kind of maybe I just sat in the in the coffee shops in Amsterdam, like you know, getting high because I tell you that stock got high. That was the fifteen years later. And look on the look back, that was one of the rock and roll stocks in Europe, one of the best performing stocks ever. I, I posted a chart. It went from like we were buying it at eighty cents, eighty euro cents. And it went to 15, 16, 17 uh, euros. Um, so anyway, so back then was the beginning. I never believed 2000. And, well, I was going to say 2008. But of course, um, it's complicated, isn't it? So um, I, I being early and coming in, yeah, um, I then exited those trades way too early. I, I, I kind of brought down all the gold thing. Uh, during the year 2005, 2006, because actually the the big, boring pension guys were coming in. You know, like that's when it truly lifts the thing. But I, but if you remember, I was beginning to say, "Hey, look, I still believe in gold. I think gold does it. It goes to at least three thousand uh, dollars." But you know, there's it's a Greek tragedy. You you really need an intervening, profound deflationary shock. Yeah, and, and I was saying back then, the Fed's got to do a Bank of Japan. It's got to go to zero. You know, so when the yeah. Fed was, you know, the Fed was at five and a half percent rates. I'm saying, look, gold goes to to three thousand if if Fed rates go to zero. You know, it doesn't just trend like things have to intervene. And so, you know, 2006 for two years, we for the best part of two years, we were trying to capture the deflationary event, which which we succeeded in doing. And then I truly, truly messed up because I came in. And I wanted to kind of bear a grudge that we we bailed out speculators. We bailed out like all the filthy people who didn't see it, who were irresponsible, who lost you know, clients a huge amount of their wealth, shrugged our shoulders, um, and 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 went back to doing the same thing. And it's like it's not for me to be the kind of moral guardian of the universe. And and in being kind of fuzzy like that, of course, I miss China spending what twenty percent of GDP, China saving the world. China yeah. just saying, you know, here's the Marshall Plan. This is how we come out. We're going to save globally uh, the world. And, and you know, the, that huge rip, you know. So gold, of course, gold got gold kind of flips between being a, a zero coupon bond and just being like a, a high beta equity, like a, an overowned popular fang. If you, it's a fang or is it or is yeah. an index linked right. bond? Yeah, right. um, and of course, it became a fang. In October 2008, and people were like, oh, and, and having to liquidate. And then they, 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 they missed, of course, the, the march to the 2000 high. Um, but I still think that the, the 3000, I mean, who knows what the numbers are, but, you know, given that I had been saying, I'd been pinning the donkey's ass at 3000, I still see the contextually. Um, contextually now, everything I'm seeing feels like it's the third act that's unfolding. It's the third act. The so gold thing. is the thing that is the glittering of gold is the thing that's got your attention right now because what all all roads lead to it for the moment for you. Well, um, again, it. I, I so I, so I, it, I have only like in the last six, two months, two months ago, I resubscribed to the Financial Times um, as an example of 
like just not being engaged. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I have to say the best part of the best part of Financial Times is the the, the on the internet is the comments section on on the big pieces. Um, and yet. I start and so I'm I'm not sitting with a Bloomberg and I don't have my I used to have this thing called chart porn and I could load any index in the world or a, you know, my my own series and and it would be set up like with my specifications and I, and I I would say yeah I want to look at this for 20 seconds and I put 2,000 charts on that thing and they go and they would just repeat and repeat and, you know it was like that was med I sat that was my meditation you know love it I, so I've not had that and yet. The damn voices, like eh, 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 I'm waking up in the middle of the night. Did you hear that? <laughs> you know, we got rats in the in the wall. What, what's going on? And 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 of course, gold. Um, we talk about so gold flared from 2009 into to the end of 2012. You know these these days better than me. Yeah. Yeah. And and then of course just had a stinking bear market. Um, had a good healthy bear market. It had a bear market of duration. You know, it lasted a long time. Um, it lasted long enough whereby um, the second uh, and, the, and the most interesting part of the bear market was it, it just didn't do anything. It went sideways. You know, it, yeah, that was a big it, tell it, for me that. Yeah, the market that's the rehabilitation. Was... Correct. And, and then the second big tell is like, again, once you put those, I mean, I was going to say you're just for, for, for vol, but in a world of, in the QE world that, we may be coming out of, but the QE world of 2008 to 2019, um, like it's almost like all vol converged to something very low, like eight to 12 month fall of eight to 10 percent. So I don't even think you've got to do vol adjustment on a on a gold versus S and P chart. Um, and and again, you could see that it was just slowly no longer like we were doing back in 2002, no longer losing risk purchasing power, if you will, to other risk assets. And then you, you did actually see um, Delta One direction. The thing started to go up. And this is all before, you know, the V, you know, the virus. So that's kind of the, the weird way that things work. Uh, that's kind of the, how the, 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 the John the Baptist, <laughs> the heretics, you know, something's actually happening. We're just not cognizant of it. And it's just the crazy people that are seeing it. And so that, that's where we were. Um, and of course, then the virus came, and and so in terms of just uh, catalytic reaction, um, just the way they come in so hard um, and, and so so big, and then of course as it's unfolding, again it, it feels like you're reading from the the pages of Anne Rand, and, and how the government is just every, is everywhere, and everything, and you know, I mean we kind of know how that ends. So yeah, that that's kind of why um, I, I, I'm using initially just the forum to kind of like a masterclass. I'm telling my journey, and I'm finding that cathartic starting at the beginning. And I'm finding you because people are kind of writing to me saying, "So do you think we're now this is the like we should be buying ag agricultural uh, agricultural futures and other commodities?" Mm, kind of, um, I know, but gold uh, is is really not a commodity, yeah. Um, and and yeah and like I I think like I said you know with with the the monetary authorities are doing this they are you know they are the plumbing is at the level of the dollar the you know that's the intervention um, they are they are intervening because they believe that that will have a, a beneficial impact on the economy um, is that true probably you know will it help the stock market kind of. Uh, what does it mean for gold? It just it just means definite things. Take out all those subject all the subjective adjectives you can use, and just start saying words like for sure, absolutely, definitely. This thing is you know rocket fuel for for the the risk asset which is gold. Yeah, I mean you know if you think about all of the voices in the gold world that have been around forever, yeah, the thing they all feared is now playing out in front of our eyes. They, when you say they feared, what they, do you mean? They feared that, and correctly so. I think all of us had the fear, particularly in the macro community. We just didn't always say gold was the choice at all times. Yeah. But the, what what we saw is we knew we had a massive debt problem, and it hadn't gone away. It got bigger. It got bigger. We knew that interest rates 
we're going to go down to zero probably in time. And that would leave a real problem, which we're about to face now, where we're about to have deflation. The market's not figured this out yet. But headline CPI is going to be negative 3, 4, 5%. And real rates are going to go through the roof. And the Fed are going to shit themselves. The only answer that they have is more. And, yeah. and so if you have ever been attracted to, go, attracted to gold, the only one thing you haven't got is a dollar bear market. But I've been writing about this for a couple of years, that the dollar and the gold and gold can go up together for a while. Yeah. And then eventually, because in a debt deflation, dollars is what everybody needs. Gold is what everybody wants. Or, or the other way around, maybe. Everybody needs gold. Everyone wants dollars. Yeah. And, and Well, so again, that, it, it's the convexity of gold because it becomes the zero coupon treasury. It's the exactly. global treasury zero coupon bond. Well, also in a world where risk parity has no – there is no – portfolio effect of owning bonds any longer, why would you not own gold instead? This is a uh, 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 Dan Tapiero, I think, raised this point. He's like, I don't understand why risk parity these days wouldn't be own equities and own gold, because it has some convexity that adds to a portfolio that bonds just don't have any longer. Yeah. So my take on that, of course, remember I said to you, um, <laughs> you know, um, Gold is like me as a schizophrenic, <laughs> and, and one minute it's your friend, and then but the next minute it really doesn't like you. Okay, <laughs> you know, so I'm saying to you that one minute it's it's is profoundly um, short volat volatility, and at the other moment is is deeply convex, like a zero coupon bond. And so my take on it really would be that you should you want to marry a gold position with a, a long vol position. Um, and which is easier said than done, but it may be becoming easier to to own volatility. And but I say maybe I, I really don't. I really don't know, and it depends on what happens. Uh, what happens next? But you know, so we we've said a lot about gold, but I have to say, so so gold was my fascination in two thousand and two, um, and I kind of. Erred somewhat. I, without it, I, I erred uh, in after 2008 because I, I won in 2008 and you know being up I don't know 31, 32 percent and I could just put the bank and just owned 100 percent long gold uh, at that point. You know with vol at 60 or 70, and I didn't. Um, but I want to say I, the thing that has obsessed me and it's another thing which has which motivated those tweets and, and my kind of the reappearance of my public persona um, was these very, very rare events when volatility goes up with stock prices. And it, as far as I believe or I can say, it's only happened in Weimar and, and like, like those – like the, the kind of really weird stock market places like Venezuela and, and well, I mean, Argentina. Well, it did happen in 99, right? The, the, I don't know if it I, I know for sure it uh, happened well, in I Japan. remember 300 vol equities in 99 in the blow-off, and I, it was extraordinary. Um, so that's the only other time I've seen it. 90, so, t so tell me more, because that, you know, I – don't recognize that data point. So you're saying 1999. You're, oh, you're saying in the in the midst of the tech bubble, uh, as we were just approaching the, the final surge, you had all going up. Yeah, and we saw those um, some of the tech names trading hundred vol, uh, which was extraordinary at the time because it was in a yeah. bear market. Yeah. yeah, but they. You're right because the the. 1998 um, to the finale was punctured with 50, 60 percent peak to trough corrections in, in those positions, yeah. which gave them. But, but what I want to say is that they were rising with a high level of volatility. OK, like and so when they had and that and that that, that, that if you will, that normalized volatility was an average of. Like the vol like went to 120 when they they halved, 
and then it, it, it reverted when they went back up. And what I want to say to you that is, is, is that actual surges in, in stock prices higher, because um, I, I spent a lot of money researching this, and you, maybe other people watching this could come back and, and, and lend any of their observations if, 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 um, if they can. But um, I am pretty sure that the only time since 1987, the, the, the crash of 87, the only time, in, maybe it's the only time in terms of a stock index, um, that the stock index went higher and vol surged higher at the same time was with the um, when um, what's he called the Japanese Prime Minister Abe Abe San went because he'd been Prime Minister like a long time ago and was discredited being too nationalistic with the whole Second World War and stuff uh, and then he got reinvented and he came back with his three arrows if you remember yeah and this, the Nikkei and topics just went boom right. Um, and vol went boom at the same time. Now there was a, for sure there were some special factors because Japan being first into zero interest rates had been the first financial society to turn, to, to weaponize vol into a fixed income security. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so those ob- obaidashi, I, I want to say, um, instruments got caught by, you know, <laughs> everything went wrong at the same time. But even over and above that, there was this remarkable moment, and we'd been looking at a trade, and we just we we, uh, we, we then put the trade on in 2013, um, just saying, well, okay, so it's happened, the un- and it's not. I was going to say the unthinkable. Um, th- there's no rule of nature that says vol can't go up with, with stock prices surging higher. It's just that it's just not. It's really never happened. Um, this, uh, the only point being that uh, that Japanese experience, um, and so the genie's out of the bottle, uh, and we and we sat with this. In <laughs> it was the most insane. I'm going to try and flesh out the position we had in it and try and put it on Twitter maybe today or tomorrow. Um, but if we had, so you kind of you know, the skew puts are always way out of the money. Puts are always like two times more expensive than yeah. calls on, on the indices. But you kind of. And, and and why? Well, why just because of the observational data that kind of like equity vol surges when when prices fall, so the puts are more expensive. If that world changes, and um, then you and you can sell those out of the money puts, you can buy so much calls. But then of course you had to structure it whereby you couldn't be naked to to being wrong. So that hence the complexity. And then there was. Um, it required a lot of carry, and so we had to engineer and we had to trade to create the carry, but. If the stock prices had moved 20% quickly, we had, I mean, gold is, is fantastic, but this position, rock and roll. And this is the position that really Chris Cole, you know, from Artemis, the, the volatility trading kind of platform um, that he had written up. That, the, if you want, like my favorite ever independent thought piece on the stock market was Volatility at World's End by, by Chris Cole. Um, and that's what we, we I, I wasted a year trading that early because, of course, Japan was in the in the midst of, of the vol regime of 2008 to, to, to last year. And, and of course, vol just went down. And so that trade was a negative carry trade that just did nothing. What if in this world, like you say, we, we like with the deflation that's coming and therefore, you know what the policy action is. Does that mean that volatility is, uh, just continues to just be subdued, or does this mean that we move into but the, the new world with the the new post virus world is a world where just possibly uh, volatility uh, may lose that that pre- the the prejudice of people's expectations? And does that mean that you're suggesting that in this environment there could be a surprise in the fact that the equity market goes higher and not lower? Well. Because um, in the end, you're owning an asset that maybe in, has some in, value perceived against the debasement of the fiat currency, for example. Yeah, yeah. So that's really hard. So during that Japanese period, so let's link two things that I said. That Japanese period, I became obsessed by a book. And I, I want to share way too much information with you. So um, my, my, my wife bought me a T-shirt saying... Um, um, I, I think my my husband loves me, 
but for sure he he loves St. Paul's even more. <laughs> something said something like that, you know. And um, and she went back to London with the kids, and I was like, oh, I mean, I've, I've got to go surfing. <laughs> I've got to be close to the beach, <laughs> etc. And, and so I think there was one like February morning. It's dark, and she was feeling quite miserable, and she decided to throw out my my library, my my book collection. <laughs> How painful is that? I mean, like, I'm sure the audience knows the pain that we're talking. No, she, my wife's wonderful, you know, and I had it coming. But but I, <laughs> I lost. She threw everything. Oh, I went to the charity shop. I mean, rare book. I mean, you name it, like, you know, 200-year-old tracks on on gold, everything uh, went. <laughs> um, and, and like I said, but then I said to you, uh, part of my re-engagement was the internet subscription to the Financial Times. And I was reading the commentary on Gavin Davis had a he has a piece weekly. Um, mm. And I was reading the the commentary and someone said, hey guys, you just got to watch this YouTube video. It's based on a Japanese book. I'm like, oh, no. And the Japanese book was uh, The Princes of the Yen. Are you familiar with that? No, I'm not. I'm writing it down no. now. The Princes of the Yen. And, and I think it's by Richard... Um, like W E I N E R, something of that nature. Anyway, I I read that book like back and forward, upside down, <laughs> from the middle to the to the ends in reverse. Um, it had such a profound impact, and clearly I wasn't alone. And some dudes have made a, a one and a half hour video montage, and it's amazing. I like. Don't, don't you don't even have to read the book now just download on youtube the princess of the yen okay um so back to your question so, so I, I provocatively and you know and i was maybe just playing data traffic and stuff um but i i kind of said hey look if you're one of those things one of those types that says we go back to the all-time highs in the s p so that would be what 3200 3250 blah um i'm like Okay, you're a hero, but actually, um, a world where we did, where where that's the default position is a world where you're not going to three thousand two hundred. You're going to two x, three x. Okay, so you're going to ten thousand on the S and P. Now, easier, actually, kind of complicated to write that given the constraints of Twitter. Yeah. But that that aside, okay, let's let's return uh, to planet Earth because what's missing from that. So we we know that I, we we know that they can, they can see that this is deflationary. They've announced, I think, globally eight trillion dollars in in um, um, fiscal spending. Yeah, ten percent of GDP. But we know that actually that's the that's the tip of the iceberg, and that the monetary module behind that is probably four or five x. That's just a really really big number. Okay, and and so you just so. You print a lot of money, and and that money bids up assets like gold. Is kind of where we leap to, and and that's where I can then say ten thousand on the S and P. But it's like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, um, because actually you always require exuberance. You need a monetary mechanism, you know, and that's that's why gold actually failed at two thousand because it, it it when we had that move from. Uh, the, uh, from 2009 to the end of 2012, you know, Niall Ferguson was out there saying America was going to be Weimar. Why was it not Weimar? It wasn't Weimar because the money that was printed had no velocity. Correct. Yeah. And and so, and that's still the obstacle. And and so back when Japan and the princes of the yen, remember the, uh, the, the, the money, they, they really changed the monetary window in Japan and the central bank was just telling the banks, expand your balance sheet, expand your balance sheet, expand your balance sheet. You know, if you're not expanding by 15%, we're going to do a bank review and I'm afraid you're not going to make it. We're going to insist that some of you lose your jobs. So like these guys, boom, boom, boom. Um, and, and if you watch the video, because we, we, we think that, I, I, my take on that was property prices went crazy and kind of normal people if you, were, were very fearful because they were having to take 100 year, 150 year mortgages. And from on the ground, from and from the intel from the books, like people couldn't believe it. You know, people ended up owning two houses, three houses, four houses because the banks just had to lend the money. Okay, mm. 
Um, so you had, I think you had 15% per annum. So that is to say bank loans were doubling every which, time. Which period was this? 86. Uh, right. into, so the, you know, Nikkei to 40,000. Yeah, okay, got it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, so that's the piece. So like I say, if it's one thing to do on a 90-word tweet, whatever. Yeah, three X S and p so 10,000. There's a lot more detail. So actually... We so you can sit there and just be right with your thesis and say gold is the out, it is the world's zero coupon uh treasury. Um, it you know, it just has it's not soiled by you know, it's it is it, 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 it's beyond sovereign risk, it, you know, it's, it's a global thing and it's the, the greatest convexity you have to this world of deflation and 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 gold is going up. Um, and I think you've got enough evidence. I think everything's on your side there. Um, for me, I am just so intrigued by how much more money you can make if we are talking about a world where the vol regime is going to shift and change and like really become funky um, because we're not prepared for that. And a, like a real example, and, and I didn't just disappear Okay, I, I was at because no, I want to I want to think I'm a smart guy. I actually concocted the my personal trade for volatility at the end of the world, and I'm living. I it's like the Truman Show. I am speaking to. I am sitting inside a gold box. I like think of not just owning a security like like gold. Think of actually being that security. You know, like and Hugh. The reason I'm here is exactly the same. Exactly. I knew, and it wasn't a coincidence I bought a place on a small island in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. No, hey, this is, hey, are we going to start singing Oasis? Hey, you and I, we see things differently. You and I, we're going to live forever. Is that where we are? I doubt. I'm ready. Yeah. But you, you and I know we can both fuck up yeah. badly as well. So for me, um, uh, like you, so following your footsteps, you, know, you, you pioneered this. Um, but for me, um, I... Last year, I, I borrowed 5 million euros, um, 20 years, fixed, and I paid 2%. And 2% was the wrong figure. It should have been, it should have been like 1.3. But I was like, whatever. Hit me, hit me, hit me. So let me just say that again. I borrowed 5 million euros um, to buy um, a property in St. Bart's, to buy a part of, like, to, believe me, it's, it's a much bigger investment than five. Um, and a French bank uh, was willing to lend me uh, fixed. Okay. That's very reminiscent. So that's assuming, that is assuming your world. That's a world where kind of gold is going to kind of go to 3000. It's going to go to 3000 because it's kind of going, it's going to be, it's going to be difficult, but there's enough financial lubrication that it won't be the 1930s, but you know, it's, it's going to be a world of, of zero interest rates uh, for a long time. And I, I just don't think that, that the banks are, are as smart as that. I think I think they've got that wrong, and I think they've got that wrong, like their German cousins um, in nine, after the First World War. Yeah, so um, Germany was devastated clearly after the First World War. Um, so was Japan after the Second World War. Yeah, and yet within fifteen years, Japan was kind of had very quickly emerged and was like approaching the income levels of of, of the West. Maybe 15 to like 20, 20 years, 20, 25 years, it was there. So uh, the fact that you're decimated, de- de- I hate that word decimated, you're destroyed by, by war, um, you know, financially, your central bank turns around, your banks are bankrupt because they own worthless pieces of paper. Um, but actually, as a central bank, you're going to say, okay, give me that, give me that worthless thing and I'll give you $100 million for it. And they're like, but it's not worth it. Thank you very much. Yeah. They're like, you're giving me 20% of Hitachi or Toshiba or Sony or whatever. You know, presently it's worthless, but give it to me and I'll give you this worthless piece of paper called the yen. Yeah. And 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 Japan re-emerged. And so the same dynamic was happening in the German economy after the First World War. And uh, then, like now, you could come in. You had to be wise, you had to buy the right asset. And and you've been great. You've preached this. Buy a like buy something tangible, real that throws off cash. Yeah, and it's and it's you've got a lot of data. Like it throws off cash in good times and bad times. I don't know, like 
cosmetics, people get depressed and they really they have to look really good in depressions and they have to look spectacular when life's <laughs> great. I don't know. I don't know. You know. Um, but you know, it throws off cash. And then you sit there and you say to the bank, hey, hit me, hit me in the banks. The bank's lending you 5 million, 10 million, 15 million, 20 million for 20 years fixed because it sees the world where interest rates are just, you know, they're, they're anchored and they're never, if anything, they're going lower. And, and so I want to be the other side of that. And, and here in St. Bart's, I, I develop, I'm, I'm going to share, actually, I'm going to share some of the properties, uh, the projects that we have, but we do uber luxury, you know, to the, the uber creditor status, the, the guys who, who, who the, the princes of the world who own the world come and, and they, they, there's no point having a private island. Uh, if you're in a private island, no one can see just how amazing your intellect and how right. amazing your courage is. Yeah, you got to come like here on uh, New Year's Eve is the greatest concentration of like the most grotesque giant super yachts in the world, and it's like a caravan park. I've been on these things. I'm like, I you could pay me to stay on these things, you know. But, you know, I get to own very, very, and, and again, a bit like gold. They don't want any more construction on this beautiful island. Yeah. And, and they're making each year, they change the civil code or the, the code of urbanism, and they make it harder and harder to, to build, to, to develop. So I, my first project, we did 550 square meters of internal space on, on an acre of land. If I did that project today, I would get about 300 square meters. So this thing now is unique. Okay. Um, and so scarcity value, uh, one of a kind, if anything, is diminishing um, in terms of uh, the supply is diminishing. And, and then I can, and no currency risk, this, this is a euro asset, I'm funding in euros, I'm funding it. And my, the next deal, oh, my bank, and so the bank calls me, right? Um, I mean, I, I, you can't really say it, but I feel like I'm having a good, a good, a good confinement. <laughs> um, the, the bank phones me and says, just thinking like the French government, you know, they, they, they want to help. I'm like, they want to help they want me. To give you a, and they want to give you a break on your mortgage. They want so a six month break. And I'm like, I'm like, what do you think? I'm like, yeah, why not? That's like, <laughs> hey, pourquoi, pour, pourquoi pas, mon ami? Merci beaucoup. Je, uh, anyway. And then I got an email and he's like, you know, from our, again, from our friends in the government, um, you can, they're willing to, to, to make a loan, they will lend you 20% of whatever whatever your average loan balance was last year. Um, no capital repayments, uh, an interest rate of 0.25%, and, and probably with the right to extend uh, maturity. Is that something you'd be interested in? So I was like, yeah, that's something I'd be interested in. <laughs> so, you know, my so... I get to, I get to live when we have like when we have a hurricane, when we have a virus. I get, I get to live in these gin palaces. Yeah, normally yeah. They, these are commercial projects. So this is not my real life. Yeah. Um, but I get to own these exclusive rare assets. I think funded at the wrong rate, and then I get and the, I, the ownership cost to me is zero because I, I this is the longest holiday letting season in the world. We get twenty six weeks a year. And so the clients pay for the financial servicing of the property. That, so there's no additional yield above the cost of finance, but it's it's free carry essentially, including maintenance. So the, the, the first few trades, um, the, the positive carry was insane. Um, before the virus, we'd bid bid away the the um, the positive carry, and we'd gone to break even, include everything, maintenance, everything. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good. Um, and I think the virus is going to. The virus, and if I get assistance from my friends in the French government with additional loan facilities, uh, I can sit because my dream is, a, and I, yeah, I think I put something out saying I'd kind of like to do a property fund here. Very hard to do, but my idea is I want like very long, very patient money. I, I want to be the central bank of this tiny little island so that when there's a liquidity issue and someone's got to sell something and they've got to sell something at the wrong price. I, I, I make the price and, and I, I clear the market. Um, still thinking about it. And I, but there's just a chance that the, the virus uh, changes 
we we might be able to restore positive carry back into that into that trade. But that's a kind of so that's my thing. Uh, that thing blows out insanely in a world where the Dow, uh, the S and P goes to 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000. And, and that's not a world where, that's not a world which is healthy. That's not a world where, like, that's not a world where ordinary people feel happy. You know, and that's the world that you understand that, that you're yeah, so the, the person who's been um, propounding that theory, you know, you know Brent, don't you, Brent Johnson? I think, I know the name, yeah. Well, he's on Twitter a lot and he's been on Real Vision a lot. He's a, he's a good friend of mine and Grant's and stuff. He has the dollar milkshake theory and his theory is a rising dollar and rising equities based on bad things, not good things. Yeah. Uh, so, and I have some sympathy for that view. I also think that what's interesting is regardless of what the equity market does, gold or your Caribbean gold box works as well. Because in a world that, let's say, goes towards where I think it's going to go, which is a longer drawn out depression of some sort, so I, you know, we have a big GDP fall and it stays low for longer, like we've seen in Italy and we've seen in Spain. And other but it's countries. like a guild is I want to call it the gilded depression, it, you because know, it's a world where you get universal credit. It's a world of 20 percent unemployment, but the state is is paying you to be unemployed. Or to yes. differ, do you think it's that, different? No, I, I, it's possible, but I don't think they'll pay you enough. So therefore, um Cash flow globally falls, which I think leads to the big insolvency. But, but the issue, know, but but can we can we just just stick on that that narrow point for a second because that's really of the moment, in the sense that um, the the initial intervention by the the U.S. Treasury, uh, where you you made available, I want to say like six hundred and fifty billion dollars for small enterprises, uh, and then you had twelve hundred dollars checks to the individuals to the workers. And of course, you, you were ready for the the surge in un, unemployment claims, and so you're 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 paying the unemployment insurance. Um, as I'm sure you read, the small enterprises are returning the loans because they're saying, well, 80% of it has to be spent on paying our paying salary, um, and we don't. We I'm not. And if we don't, if we fail to spend that, then you want the money back kind of immediately, and we kind of don't know for two factors because there's going to be social distancing. We don't know how willing people are going to be. But secondly, I can't get damn staff. Everyone's they're, they're happy sitting at home because the unemployment check for now is is better than kind of cleaning the dishes. And that's, I mean, that's a messed up situation. Yeah, but also in the end, to paper over. Uh, a debt crisis or a, or a solvency problem with more debt is not the answer. You're the flip side of that, right? So you're able to service debt and therefore to to take on more debt is great. I remember my old boss, Noam Goddesman, back in 2008, borrowing a shit ton of money because he knew he could. Now, nobody else wants that debt. So my brother-in-law, who owns a restaurant in Asheville, North Carolina... Sure, you can give him, and he's, you know, he's a great chef, and it's a good restaurant, but to give him more debt terrifies him because yeah. the debt is the issue. So there is a velocity of money issue. Huge, um, huge, and again, huge. you know, it's a, it's a reason why St. Bart's property goes up, but other stuff still falls. I think there's a, I still worry that there is a solvency event and maybe somewhat from the gilded box, you don't see it as much as it would be. Oh, for sure. But then, but then I, I was listening to you intently um, <laughs> and I felt you, you were prejudicial, Pre prejudicial in the way that we've all felt ourselves be prejudicial in our understanding of macro and crisis. What, what, what was the, what's the amazing book? Uh, Panics, Manias and Crashes, whatever by yeah. Crashes, 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 yeah. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the Kindleberger. Kindleberger, the, yeah, you, you can't, you can't be a global macro manager student wannabe without like being able to you know um recite a chapter in verse um but we lived in a world where actually it doesn't the, the linkages and the causality haven't happened and we know it's been kind of replaced god forbid but we live in a world just now where the 
dominant uh, ideology um, is what is it called? Modern monetary theory? Is it MMT? Yeah. Or is it is that what it's called? Um, yeah. Because it, it's, it's so. I'm a little bit out of it in terms of the, the MMT or what have you. I keep calling it PMT, but I'm thinking of something else. <laughs> um, uh, what I want to say, because you're saying the solvency event, right? It, it, it's just, it's not right. It's not proper that you can just spend your way out of the crisis like we did out of Lehman from 2008. No, I don't it's, think it's not right. No, I don't, I don't argue that at all. Because I okay. actually do think MMT is much like the New Deal was. I think it's doable. What happens to the currency markets or the price of gold in that? Okay, that's great. That's a great macro equation for us to all play. Can a massive fiscal stimulus that actually rebuilds and does create some productive use of assets, new assets, let's say? Yeah, I think that could work. What I'm saying is paying somebody 20% less than their income to give them a um, subsidence living destroys cash flow for companies that are already in debt. So my fear is that playing out with a very little time. I mean, basically, everyone blew through all of their savings in one month, including every small business. So, But take me to the edge. Push me over the edge because you said solvency. Give, describe the solvency issue that says, you know, I'm coming in and I'm cleaning this shit house. okay? Yeah, so... How does it end? Because I don't see, I, I, I'm not smart enough yet. So I'm listening. So the solvency event for me is, I, I use the restaurant because it's the easiest one for us all to understand because we go into them all the time. So if you go to China right now or Singapore, there's social distancing in restaurants. So they've reopened. Hurrah, equity market rallies. And there's been some subsidies for people to keep them afloat. Most of that is in form of new debt. There is some cash handouts too. But you open your restaurant and here the magic happens is you can only have half or less the number of customers. The moment you open your doors, you have to pay staff. The moment you open your doors, you start puking money. When you furlough your staff and negotiate with your landlord to not pay rent, you can hold in the deep freeze for a period of time. You reopen you're fucked in a couple of months. And that has a knock-on effect, right? So everybody gets tipped out of jobs because you're going to downsize the number of restaurants. That's okay. That's that's how the cycle works. But the problem is, is that happens at scale because of the unemployment, and you've got unemployment benefit of which people are starting to save. I think you'll likely see the saving rate rise because of the issues that the behavioral and emotional issues people have faced from this. They're not going to go back and open the bottle. Well, I don't think they'll... They, I, they will not have the means to save. They won't be earning enough to save. Okay, fine, fair enough. But the chances of consumption going back to the same level hmm. is unlikely for an extended period. Okay, but then can I say to you, okay, okay, so that I can, I can, I fully get that. I, I can see that happening. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I'm like the new Chancellor of the Exchequer. <laughs> this guy's incredible in the UK. He's like, what's the problem? No problem. Like, let's just spend, like, how much do you need? No problem. This guy's the most popular politician ever. And he looks really nice. He always smiles. Like, what's the problem? No problem. Okay, so I, I'm going to role play that. And you've just, I mean, you've, I'm, my, my smile, I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. I'm, ba I'm back being, what's he called? The UK Chancellor? So maybe know. your name, I, I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, um, Sonny, you know, <laughs> the end, Sonny disposition, he says, okay, hey, the problem here is like, we're, so you, you open and you, and you hemorrhage, so don't open, um, just furlough. And, and so then you say, yeah, but like, you know, okay, so these are low-skilled, unless they were talking about the restaurant and the kind of lower-skilled elements of that, and they yeah. sit there on unemployment or universal credit. And, and so I'll, I'll problem solve, and I'll say the problem with that scenario: universal credit's too low. I'm gonna, I'm gonna double it. Okay, what's your problem now? Okay, so and you said, well, how are you gonna fund that? No problem. Are you serious? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm sovereign. Um, I'm, you know, my, my I'm UK. My government debt to GDP is a hundred. I look at Japan. Those crazy guys are at like, what are they? They're at like two twenty. This is beautiful, right? Yeah. So this is where constructing a macro theory framework or portfolio, 
you have these two things, right? You have an insolvency event or you have a massive transfer in some way, shape or form onto the central bank balance sheet, the government and then the central bank, right? In both those equations, there are certain bets you can construct that have high probability outcomes, which is where it gets interesting, where it doesn't matter what happens. We just know it's going to be extreme. So therefore, go back to the beginning of our conversation, the, the probability of gold rising strongly and further than most people expect is extremely high. It's yes. as good a quality macro bet as I can think of. Absolutely. Um, it is also intuitively what drives me, and I don't think you've gone down the rabbit hole yet, to Bitcoin, which is another one for me that I find uh, you'll get there, I promise you, and you'll end up. Your hair I see you're still, I, yeah, I see you you're will. still 27% down on your That's Bitcoin. Right. To, uh, eulogize about, it when you're making money, but anyway. Okay, do that. Eulogize I, I, it when I can explain it, but anyway. But forgive me, that was mean. I didn't mean to be mean. That's all right, because I already made 10x the first time around. So <laughs> 200 to 2,000, I sold out early, went to 20,000. So I made 10x and felt like a Hey, dick. do you know, that thing, made, that, that, that thing made my life a misery because uh, I was doing a presentation and I thought it was like just clients and there were kind of newspaper hacks. And, and I, yeah, I, I just speak kind of, um, I shoot from the hip and, and I wanted to, I was talking about, I think I said this in 2011 or something. And I was talking about 2012, 30, 2013, I was talking about a world, everything goes up. Okay. Um, and someone said, what about Bitcoin? I'm like, Bitcoin goes to like a million bucks. I just meant that metaphor. It, like it goes up a lot. Right. And like I, on my grave, it's going to say, Here's the guy that said Bitcoin is going to. Maybe it will. Maybe it will. But like a you know, genius. And it, and you know, but I got such a hard time. And it and as you know, it went from I don't know six hundred. No, it went from three hundred to one thousand eight hundred or more. I don't no, it went from um, one hundred and eighty to twenty thousand in one run. And I said, I, I, my comment, I think, was about six hundred, six fifty. Uh, and I said, it's going to go to a million, but it's going to go up a lot. So that's, I, I just, uh, whatever. So, so I'm interested again to just think through this, right? Because we've got two potential outcomes and neither of us claim to know which one outcome is going to happen. I have a hunch on one. You may have a hunch on another, whatever way. So we've got this theory about gold. So what else do we construct around it? You've got an interesting idea that potentially in one of these scenarios, the equity market goes up a lot. Yeah. Okay. And of which... The upside in so wildly out of the money calls in the S and P, and I'm particularly interested in the S and P because there is clearly an indexation effect going on. So you're playing that, and there's clearly um, a situation where smaller businesses will fail versus large businesses. There's a land grab going on, and you so, get all of that. So you get all of that with that call option. So that's that's I think's a very interesting bet. I also think that. But then I say you've got to remember that's is negative carry, you've got to fund it. And, yeah. and I thought I, I like remember I haven't managed professionally money for, for, for a long time. And what I did like was why not fund? Because you can buy five thousand twenty twenty one calls on the S P for nothing, obviously. Um, but you know, nothing if you're a hedge fund is like 25 basis points that as soon as you trade, it's going to be marked at zero. And so you're going to lose 25 basis points on one position on one trading day yeah. for just that kind of small position. And then you're going to have to refeed it every whatever, you know. Um, but given from what you've said and the impetus of the monetary response and the dollar monetary response, um, sell volatility on the dollar cross or sell volatility in fixed income. Because we know that those, because the two things about um, modern monetary theory is actually you can keep uh, expanding the franchise of the central bank's balance sheet. Uh, you can you can do that to infinity unless you lose control of the currency um, and or typically at the same time, your yield curve steepens. Okay. But if those two events don't happen, like back to my point of like, oh, let's just double universal credit, you know, just I can just keep kicking this into touch, right? Uh, because, not, you know, maybe when we get to Japanese level, you know, like 
with all of the spending, which is baked in by the U.S. Treasury and with the slowdown in GDP, what are we talking about U.S. debt to GDP in five years' time? I think it's going to be like 120% of GDP. So 100 percentage points less than, than Japan. And, and so that's what I, I keep coming back to, a yeah, gilded depression. I don't disagree with that. So here comes another output that I think is interesting, right? So my preference is on the deflationary solvency event. Okay, fine. Which so, you've got, that's your gold position. So, well, yes, but I think gold works in both. But we've yeah, got yeah. equity side of the equation that we've talked about, which is an interesting bet that's not yeah. priced in. The other side that's not priced in is the opposite bet, which is the negative rate bet in fixed income. It's actually really cheap to construct option strategies around it. You know, I've been looking at like uh, on five year futures, you could do it on, on euro dollars, whatever. You can do the, like these butterflies that pay out 20, 30 times your money if they have to bring interest rates. So in the situation where they're going to do massive monetary printing, we also know they're going to try and keep interest rates as low as possible. So it doesn't cost them anything. <laughs> they're not stupid. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So therefore, the probability in both scenarios of negative interest rates or zero pinned at zero to negative, I think, is a tail that's not priced. So I, that's interesting. Costs you virtually nothing Absolutely. to do as well. So, so I agree with that. So you, so essentially, we've we've got a we've got a kind of triangle. We've got like equity, and it could go anywhere. It's just it's just as crazy, you know. It's a funky reggae party to quote Bob, <laughs> uh, Bob, Uncle Bob Marley. And but it's kind of underpinned, if you will, at the at the base of it is is fixed income. And the currency, and and that's MMT, yeah? Um, yeah, and and so and we know that the impulse has, like they they will go to all all lengths to ensure stability at the core of the pyramid, um, and if, if if going to all means means taking those rates negative to stop the yield curve like uh, changing, or the dollar getting too strong, which is or the dollar getting too strong, then so that's why you need. I think that's that's genius if you can put those trades on. You have that. And at the same time, you can do my trade and buy those deep out of the money by selling like move vaults, fixed income. Yeah, we need to solve that part is where can you safely sell something to pay for both of those very cheap bets? Because gold is your core position. I don't, I, I'm not yet sure what carry you can take to pay for it because the uncertainty of the outcomes makes carry unattractive to me. What? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, for sure. For uh, again, but it's, but that's why presently I'm sitting. You know, maybe the economy is going to change. Uh, the economy, anyway, whatever. For sure. Um, for yes, sure. For sure. Property, property is a potential carry. Uh, well, I, that's that's my trade just now because, as, as I said to you, uh, all, I, I've got like I don't like the pricing that I'm confronted with just now in my tiny little bubble universe because my my my. My convex trades are flat carry, so they're zero carry. Okay. Whereas when I started, I was getting earned to put the trades on, and if and if we if I get a kind of reversal, short term reversal in prices, maybe I can get a positive carry convex trade. That's always that's what we're that's what we're seeking. What we've just discussed, what we've outlined as a possible portfolio structure, is um, a, a desire. So gold doesn't give us carry, and we're talking about just being delta one long there. Um, and then we're, we're saying, why not have a, a look at these out of the money, like 5,000 stripe uh, S&Ps? We don't want to sell because we, you know, you could sell, um, you could sell for a 1,500 S&P put. My God, you could buy so much uh, protect, um, convexity, but you'd never make the journey. So that's out. So I think I'm coming in, I'm saying, let's sell vol on, on fixed income. And on the dollar crosses, because we know that the medicine men are going to, they're just, that's not going to be a, it's not going to be a market rate. That's going to be a rate determined by bureaucrats. Okay. And we put that together. And so the question, the question is always, don't tell me what happens. Don't tell me, we're traveling from A to B and it's not, don't eulogize about point B. Just tell me about every twist and, and turn in the journey from A to B. So what, what are the secret risks that we are underwriting in that trade, which could flare at, at inopportune well, moments and take us out. We don't mind losing the premium on the fixed income or the equity bet, right? Yeah. 
on the gold bet, okay, that is the core base of the bet, but we think in all outcomes it's a superior trade. So the probability of losing money is relatively low. Yeah. It, it, the probability of losing money on the gold trade fine. in terms of the vantage point of the destination, right, is is like you're, you're just going to make money, okay? However, like I said, there's going to be moments when gold is not a zero coupon fixed income deflationary trade, but it's a fine and the stock market wants to go down because – the geniuses that kind of manage your money have recognized that actually it's not that bullish that confinement is over. It's not that bullish as businesses open up and actually have to stop again, okay? And the stock market heads heads down, right? Uh, got an idea. What about your old trade? What about to buy gold versus the stock market? Because we already own the upside. Yeah. But we know that gold is cheap compared to the market, right? So the relative we could, so we do the relative trade in long gold, short S&P, or no, make no, it even no. easier for yourself. Make it the Russell 2000, so it's less concentrated in the big names. And then you own those two wing bets, and maybe that covers that. Um, it, it, it does. It covers that, um, the, but then what happens is, so the, the, the wing that you're then exposed to is my notion of the German bank or my French bank lending me money today, but the German bank kind of was on the recovery mode back in 1918, 1919. And then we have the Treaty of Versailles and we have this reparations demand for gold. But the, you know, the, the, the victorious French are like, <laughs> this is serfdom, you're going to be our slaves forever and you're going to transfer 20% of your GDP every year to us. Um, and you get this... You, you get you end up the Germans have got no choice but to debase their currency and in debasing their currency you know, the, you get the Weimar like asset price inflation. I don't want to be short the S and P in long gold in a world where the the S and P might be going to five thousand, six thousand, seven thousand. You've already got the call, and gold's going to go up in that situation. Well, you've got the call, true. Yeah, no, true. You got the call. You've got the call and your okay. long gold. Okay. Yeah. So what you're saying is actually the the one risk in the one of the biggest risks in the trade. Is is the principal delta one position? Correct. It's Frankenstein. It's it's either zero coupon or fang, um, and and so you're trying to dampen that kind of flip. Yeah, to give you yeah. a better chance of letting this play out. Because as you and I know, it's very easy to be right in a long term view. It's fucking hard to do it and hold on mm. to the trade in the middle. <laughs> I still think, but I I I would maybe suggest like just. Don't supersize the delta one Correct. gold position, or just just own it, but not not supersized, right? And I think that your uh, the convexity from your negative interest rate derivatives, uh, I think they will flare. They will produce a P and L at the moment when gold becomes Absolutely. like a fine. Yeah, they they should do. They should yeah. do. Yeah, because the probability because, yeah. negative rates goes up massively in a falling stock market. We know that. Because there's a reaction function to central banks as well understood. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So what we're demonstrating as two old geezers <laughs> is <laughs> that in managing and thinking about uh, the taking risk on behalf of, um, of of clients and other people, um, it is not just a question of how much we're going to make, how much do we need to make. It's a question of safe passage. It's I've got to be able to sell this view, this, you know, it's like being an art, you know, for sure, I'm a piss artist, but I like to think of the, my artistic endeavors. But I start with it. We started this conversation with a blank canvas, right? And we kind of right. go, eh, we squiggle there. And now what we're doing is we're trying to convince a, a group of wealthy patrons um, to participate and sponsor our view or our multiple views of, of scenarios which may play out. Um, and and we're going to sit there and we're going to curate and we're going to take good care of that 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 beautiful painting that you know that that's going to enrich you know, all of our friends. I think it's, it'll be fascinating for people to watch this. Is how that portfolio construction thing is not straightforward. It takes a lot of time. And you know, you and I have yes, we've thrown together some ideas here, 
Yeah. But there's a whole lot of testing that needs to be done on something like that because you're trying to construct a long-term view that needs to be robust enough to be able to hold the position. And that, you know, that, that takes a lot of analysis and time and thought and kicking the tires and saying, what if I'm wrong and where am I wrong? Because it's always... I think the majority of your time is, is spent on that. I, yeah, it's, like it's 20, 30% like, coming up with smart ideas. You know, like smart people are dime a dozen sort of thing. But being able to program it into a machine that can actually give you safe passage. Managing other people's money um, and the type of person that chooses to manage other people's money um, is a kind of traumatic experience, or it can be. You know, um, you you do spend you, you you persuade yourself that you're having near death situations, which is ridiculous. You know, it's like you you wake up in my go. You know, oh shit! I'm going to die today. They're going to kill me today, and it's you know it's ridiculous. I mean, of course, it's part of the, it's what creates the drive. Um, and and it's kind of what you get paid. It's also kind of what you get paid for. You you have to feel sick on behalf of the customer, right? Yeah, um, exactly. So I, I for sure I can't bitch about it. But when you stop and you're no longer, I guess, flooded or with that chemical reaction, uh, and you get time to reflect. You kind of, you know, go into a kind of funny, a funny space, um, a, a time of reflection, and so I kind of went through that, and and you know, I was I was saying to Grant the other day, I think I I went from being a kind of so-so hedge fund manager to being a really good villa manager, um, <laughs> but mm, you know. Um, when it comes, when it came to you know the New Year's Eve parties on on the island here, <laughs> you know I think I was receiving the invitation for villa managers and not for <laughs> rock stars, <laughs> and so I thought, uh, you know, yeah, you know, after two years, I guess you, your ego fears that um, you, you're becoming irrelevant. Yeah. yeah, it's a weird life. I mean, I did it when I when I left managing uh, the macro fund and moved to Spain. You suddenly lose a lot of what your your identity originally was it's good because you can rediscover yourself but you realize that part of you is driven by that adrenaline that kind of dopamine function is is so strong within us because it's all we've known it it is um and then you know because i spent a lot of time uh, talking it out if if you were <laughs> you know and uh, you might the my, my favorite metaphor has been that you know the the glass jam jar yeah, those beautiful glass jam jars and as soon as you wake up in the morning it's filling with sand and the sand is all the kind of all the noise all just the kind of unsatisfying things in our daily life and and the challenge is to get to the end of the day with you know little little pebbles of of dopamine and that dopamine like you say it, it can come from like just hitting it out of the boundary with a with the trade which you've long reflected on and it's sat in the portfolio and you've had that moment where it's, it's, it, the moment has passed and, it's, and you've been able to monetize it. Wow. Um, and of course, that's kind of shallow and superficial. Um, you can get the dopamine release from someone like holding a door and smiling. You know, and it's remarkable, those tiny little things, mm. they're just as powerful. They, they, they take up the same space in the jam jar. But if you get to the end of the day and there, and there are no pebbles in your jam jar, kind of you're beginning to lose your vibration as a person and therefore you're not resonating happiness you're not resonating you're just not an interesting person and that, i fear that that's that's where i was uh that's what i was said and so i was overcompensating with um surfing i'm still the world's worst stand i know stand up surfer which is just not sexy but um and and, and various other like the mind is still overactive but um i i, I feel like this year um, I I felt like I want to sh like just participate again um, and be subject to that the 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 joy of having a random you know life. and you you know you've got a formidable intellect and you have to use it you can't not and you know especially when you know I always refer to it as the beautiful puzzle which is what we do in the macro world and when you end up in a situation like we're in now you can't not use it that puzzle needs to be solved and you need to be part of that conversation yeah why well, I, I, my wife keeps saying shut up <laughs> again i'm like you know what 
you know, this this is I've been an analyst all my life. You know, we we deal with data, and you know the you know the, my success, if I, whatever whatever success uh, that I have enjoyed has been not cocking a snoop, you know, not, not showing disrespect, but showing a a respectful kind of a fear of experts. Um, experts are just consistently always wrong, you know, and I, and my hedge fund career, I put myself at great distance from experts, like an experts from all walks of well, typically from, you know, from investment banks and like going to industrial experts. And I made it, I tried to make it as hard as possible for them to reach me. Um, and then I saw opportunities where there was a disconnect because clearly there was an expert Again, let's use that word, res, who was you know, um, putting this message into a marketplace, which was resonating with the community, um, and and you and it was coming back to you all the time, but it wasn't there in the chart, you know. Like so, there was there'd be a like a, a, a bullish resonance from the community. People would be talking about it, but then you look at the instrument and it'd be trending lower, or vice versa. So experts for me have all kind of they've been a source of like they kind of make me angry because I go, really? I want to ask you questions. And when I press you, I'm not, I mean, you know, um, and then I, I've typically found opportunities and, and here we are. And, and it's not our financial portfolios, but it's our life. Yeah. Uh, lives that are presently being largely controlled by experts. I keep saying, I always kind of want to say I failed, but you know, it was like, you know, it's like someone was recommending uh, that book by the, the female poker player. Um, I can't remember her name, and and just making the point that you know sometimes you sit you sit there with the best like what seems statistically like it's the best hand and you still lose that there's there's still um, an unknown quantity of luck like just bad shit can just get in the way and and the the the, the measure of great traders is not to believe the kind of I'm a moron because I sat there with a very strong hand. And I didn't make money. Like, even with the best hand, you're not guaranteed. Like, shit can happen. And the lucky guy next door, you know, he wins. That, but if you do, if you lose that discipline, you know, when you come back and you have that, you have those those three cards again, and you don't play it because you say, ah, oh, but the last time it didn't work. That's yeah. that's when and you've lost wrong, it. Because it's like you know, it's the reality is is sometimes you see an eighty percent probability. I think this gold thing is something like a seventy or eighty percent probability. I would say in my mind. There's a 30% chance of being wrong. And that's yeah. a pretty big chance of being wrong. And so I was you, wrong the last time. Who cares? It's, it's a 70 80% probability goes in the book. You do it again, you do it again, do it again. And over time, you'll win. Yeah. Hugh, look, as ever, amazing to sit down and have a chat. It's just, it's been too long. Um, and look, I'm going to get you back on a few times because I love just thinking through things with you because, you know, you're a unique thinker. And I think with the benefit of distance, great uh, you gain great insight and I, I honestly think it's one of the reasons i love being here in little cayman i write gmi from here i live mainly in grand cayman it's because i'm away from the noise and the noise is the hardest part of this game the best part is the thinking and the more time you get to think and that's why you know i, I just knew you'd have some fresh perspectives that i just wanted to, to hear well if i could just ask for a, a little uh, commercial plug myself because you know i don't want to manage other people's money um and i i'm too damn lazy to do what you do like that 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 piece that you put out all the time i just i only have respect for the effort like that's a tough tough gig but my thing was always you know son of a truck driver is like give me your best shot give me your best trade and, and what we're doing is peer-to-peer -peer trade review yeah and that what i'm thinking about is i kind of want to do a form of consultancy uh, very confidential consultancy where as a CIO and our CIOs are getting younger and younger, you know, um, you can pitch, pitch me your best trade confidentially and say, what do you think? Like, do you think I've got enough information? How would you do it? I don't want to manage your portfolio. But the thing is, I'm probably the only person, there's no one else in your organization that's going to say, no, nah. your clients are not going to kind of say, they're going to say, yeah, whatever you need one, and I'm not to say I'm always a doubting Thomas, but you need 
you know, it goes back. There used to be this legendary macro conference where, you know, people like Alan Howard would stand up with their best, they pitched their best trade. The drop so, the Drobnikov. Yeah, you know, Steve, Steve uh, and Andrew, you know, yeah. you pitch the best. Why would you do that? You do it because A, you've got it, so you're front running, okay? Um, and B, you do it because it's only with the, the people you're surrounded with there, these like people with superpowers, they're the guys that are going to say, yeah, you, you missed it. You, you, this is, look at this part, like like we've just done. So I, I'm thinking I'd like to monetize an element yeah. of that. I mean, I do, I do, I do some of that uh, macro consulting for people. And, and, you know, I think it's particularly in a macro world like now, you know, it actually didn't matter three years ago. We were irrelevant and you opted, you were exactly the right time out of the market because we were just irrelevant. Yes, we saw the flare up in 2015, got interesting. Then it kind of died back down again. It's a macro world. So, you know, I think it's a very interesting thing because 30 years of experience are worth a lot to somebody else. I agree. Well, listen, time is, is precious and I've taken up a lot of your time, so I'm going to let you go. And, and uh, I want to say hi to the community. Uh, nice to, 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 be, to, be, to be here and, and find have your this conversation. <laughs> Instagram, Hugh Hendry Official on Instagram. Come on, get over your prejudice. Have some fun. No want to see you in a bikini. We've talked about this. It's, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> a mankini is coming. Thank you very much. You fabulous. Thanks. If you're ready to go beyond the interview, make sure you visit realvision.com where you can try Real Vision Plus for 30 days for just $1. We'll see you next time right here on Real Vision.